Hi, this is the show that answers the questions that expats, nomads, and full-time travelers living across the globe ask themselves every day. These insights and secrets are shared when we interview experts and authors from across the globe. Our guest today is James Hammond, who has been traveling as a slow mad since 2013, other than gaps due to COVID. And you will hear in the background some parrots. Now, I'm not in the Amazon, but I, we are pet sitting an African gray, a cake parrot from the Amazon and one from Australia. So pardon the beeping and enjoy this super episode by a young man who has over a decade of experience of life in the travel lane. Hello everybody, this is Nomadic Diaries and it's my pleasure today to introduce you to someone who is going to, I know, share some amazing experiences out of his diary. Audience, please meet James Hammond. Hello, how are you doing? I'm doing well, James. It's so great to meet you. And I'm so excited about this conversation. We could have had it over coffee because we're only, what, 100 miles from each other? Yeah, that's a shame, isn't it? It's just over the border. Um, <laughs> one day. Let's, do, let's put that in a diary one day. Yeah, well, maybe you'll come to Mexico one day. Absolutely, on the list. Excellent. Well, I can I can help you with that. <laughs> yeah. um, I just wanted to share that a little bit about James, that he has been working and traveling on the road, basically, since 2013. And his favorite thing is to seek out new adventures, meet people from different cultures, and absolutely feed his wanderlust. So he's been around the world a couple of times. He's currently in, oh, I see a picture of you on your website in one of my favorite places on the planet, which is in Jordan. And that is a very, very special country, I believe. So currently, James is in Vancouver. Tell us a little bit about what happened before you decided that adventure had come into your top of your mind and your consciousness and you just had to go so the story is post school so sixth form in uk which is like 17 18 years old i was um studying music so i played guitar i went to a music college called bim in london so if you've got american listeners that's like berkeley in california so the equivalent oh. of that in london uh, pretty intense uh, four-year course and loved it until midway through um i had an ex-girlfriend in norwich where i brought to my attention this concept of traveling which wasn't really on my radar because my background's quite working class you know not survival is a bit of a strong word but just no money so going on holiday is is completely out of the question so yeah she brought to me attention this thing called travel she said she went for three months and that blew my mind i was like oh wow what is that and then that same year i booked a trip to australia to watch the cricket and when <laughs> i went to australia and i stepped on the hot pavement of Perth, and it was like nice and hot and smelled nice and it's clean. I was like, wow, what is this place? And that kind of really kicked off the Wonderlust. And then from there, it's like a two year plan finish the degree, save some money, and let's go off in January 2013. Which is what you did. Yeah, yeah, put a plan in place, got some money together. I had about £7,000 I scraped together. So that's working in the summers in university, going back home after university, doing full time work try not to spend as much money and that is pretty much what I went with and I had a work visa in Australia planned and booked as well so I had a two-year trip pretty much in the pipeline. So you I heard you say that you went back you finished your degree you made a plan you took the time and the energy to think through the plan and figure out the top of your the the top of mind place for you. Tell me a little bit about that process yeah, it's a great question because initially it's a plan for myself, right? So I thought, right, I want to go back to Australia. Uh, I know New Zealand's pretty close. Um, geography is pretty good. So I'm like, New Zealand's there and Fiji is there. I'm like, oh, we can just do that little triangle for three <laughs> months before settling in Australia, right? So I mentioned this to one of my friends at college who's also a guitarist uh, called Mikey. And he said, ah, oh, I really want to do that. Do you fancy going to Southeast Asia? I'm like, ah, oh, what's there? He said, oh, come on, let's do, let's do three months, like Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam. Really out of my scope of knowledge, really. Didn't really know what to expect. But I said, yes. yeah, okay. So we 
it got from a three month sort of travel trip with no work to six months and we just ha about had enough money so the trip was go to sda which is a used to be a travel agency in uk now defunct because of covid and they booked some flights like around the world so four or five flights we're going from london to uh, bangkok and then i think one from obviously kuala lumpur down to australia and across these like different areas and in between we sort of travel with where we want to go so it's a mix of sort of flights booked in to make sure we get to the main places but in between we're kind of winging it hence the name of my podcast and just seeing where we want to go day to day and it honestly was the best time oh that's great excellent so you did this journey, you took this journey for six months. And did that take you back to the UK ultimately? No. So this is a, a full two years about going back home. A full two years before going mm. back home. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So what has your experience been on the road that much? Now, I just have to say, I've never been on the road that much. I have lived outside the country. I've lived outside of Scotland for over four decades yeah. and lived in multiple countries. But being a planted expat is very different from being a nomadic or a roving expat. But I do have many friends and colleagues and I've done the roving for short periods of time. What is the secret to staying really grounded and centered in in your travel yeah i think the work visa in australia helped because i had a clear plan in my mind right so it's going to be yeah. six months of traveling which is essentially going place to place quite quick travel um ticking off experiences if you like trying to meet as many people as possible staying in hostels mm -hmm. uh, quite a bit of partying at the time it's quite young uh, that sort of travel but then the work visa meant that i was grounded for a year and mm -hmm. essentially you australia you know, let's not put it down too much it's like home it's, it's a different <laughs> place but it speaks english yeah. it's a bit warmer weather the work yes. culture is the same so yeah. i i knew i had to get a job uh, in melbourne for six months which i did and then i knew my second half of the year in australia i had to get a job to extend my visa if i wanted which means farm work so i worked on vineyards drove tractors in a farm in western australia in margaret river southwest and then, then i knew after that i had three, four, five months, depending on how much money I had, in South America, working my way up to mm -hmm. North America. Mm -hmm. I think there's quite a bit of structure to it. I know in between can seem a bit winging it, if you like, I keep mentioning that term. Yes. But there was structure because I knew I had to get a job, I had to save money again. And I think that helped because I think you can get a bit of burnout when you travel and you just kind of going day to day, no real structure, yeah. what you're trying to do, what yeah. you're trying to achieve. Yeah. That can get tiresome, believe it or not. So... I was yes. glad I had that. And I knew I was going home eventually, November 2014. So yes. I knew that was coming. Um, and that, I guess, is what I was references, be, referencing because I find that now um, I talk a lot, we talk a lot here about purpose-filled travel. Mm. And how would you describe that? Or what is your reaction to that phrase when you hear it? I think that depends on a number of factors in my experience age is a thing yeah whether we like it or not <laughs> uh, so that first trip that two-year trip very hedonistic you know a lot of partying um not really a purpose to really like indulge in too much culture just like trying to find mm -hmm. fellow backpackers have a have fun have a bit of a laugh do some experiences probably a bit more um brash is the word there maybe in terms of I would do stuff that I look back going, oh, I've done that. So a couple of examples would be I've done a mine tour in Bolivia, which was a working mine. So you know, I went mm -hmm. and bought dynamite for the miners, you know, that sort of stuff where you go into someone's workplace wow. and essentially you've got a travel tour group kind of looking at that and you've got actual people work there. You know, I'm not sure how I feel about that today, but those sort of experiences are quite dangerous. You know, that was kind of the purpose, I guess, back in those days. And maybe I look back a bit fondly because I'm like, oh, it's a bit more outgoing in those days but now a bit older i'm a bit more in, invested in culture local mm -hmm. people meeting people like yourself talking about travel and also trying to understand what is the world that we live in whereas back then i wouldn't say i didn't care but it wasn't a big thing it's just going to do what you want yeah so i think purpose kind of changes over time and i think your interests change over time we've just done a year away again but it's a very different trip to that one 10 years ago so 
learned some valuable lessons this time around. Excellent. So when you say you just did another year away, between the time that you got back to the UK and prior to that year away, mm. uh, where were you? <laughs> yeah, so 2015 was like a year off uh, back at home. I guess I felt like I needed to go back home. I couldn't really tell mm -hmm. you why. I quickly learned that mm, it's not for me. I think I need to keep going somewhere else. So then 2016, I met my current partner mm -hmm. and we decided to quite early on in the relationship, very early on, that we were going to give New Zealand a go. So that was a New mm. Zealand work permit and Asia before and after. Um, that was like a, a fair chunk of trip. Came back briefly, but whilst New Zealand, we did book our Canadian visa. And when you get to 31, you kind of run out of these options, right? Because you're too old for work permits. So Canada was the last visa we could do. Mm. And been here five years, chucked COVID in there, meant that we couldn't travel, hence the trip we've just been on. So... Yeah, Australia, New Zealand, work permits, visas, and living at home for a bit, but also traveling around a bit more of the world, Asia, the Americas, and stuff like that. Yeah, it's been an interesting journey so far. So that's something that um, I don't think I've had a conversation with someone about is on the subject of work permits. Mm. And um, you talked about aging out work permits. Can you explain a little bit more about what that means and how countries are looking at it? Because now... We have a whole new culture that has been uh, that has grown exponentially since COVID in the form of our digital or global nomads, yeah. right? Yeah. So yeah. tell me about have some of those digital nomads been some of the people that aged out of those sort of teenage young visas? It's a great question. Okay, yeah. There, there is a COVID is a thing here. I think we need to put that into context. Let's say pre COVID, right? Yes. And the world was seems like the old the old days almost now. Yes. <laughs> um, if you're from countries like Australia, New Zealand, UK, Canada, uh, Japan, um, Taiwan, uh, these sort of countries offer work permits to go and work in another country for a year or two up to an age limit. So what I mean by that is that I could get a work permit in Australia because they allow UK people to buy a work permit for a year. It's about 400 Australian dollars at the time. And you can extend it whilst you're there for another second year. And they just introduced a rule for a third year. But there is an age limit to it. So the rule is 18 to 31 or 35 countries have different rules. You can get one of these permits. And they're pretty good. You can work in any employer. You can travel around as much. There's no real rules. You just need to leave by the time your visa ends. So people have these choices from 18 to 35 in different countries around the world. And I don't think many people realize this. Um, the one regret I have is I didn't do the one in Japan. So... If you're from UK listening right now and you're uh, younger than 31, which I'm not anymore, unfortunately, you can get a one year work permit in Japan and there's a lot of English speaking jobs there. So that means you pay for it, you get issued it, you literally go and immerse yourself in Japanese culture, right? So they are available for a lot of younger travelers. And I think a lot of backpackers use them as a base to go for two years, right? Like I did travel, work in Australia, travel. Yeah. go to another one or go back home that's really good to know so um i lived in japan for a couple of years and i think ah. the english jobs back then this is almost 30 years ago right the english jobs back then were mostly being the cartoon characters at disneyland oh okay <laughs> like the princess or you know beauty and the beast or any of those sort of cartoons and they would call out to you in english I do remember mm -hmm. that. Uh, and you could tell that they had hired a few English speakers, yeah, you, Americans or Brits, and um, that was where they strategically put them. Mm. So this is something that's available for 18 to 35. Recently, just in the last month, Japan has announced their version of a golden visa program that I'm sure you're aware of, mm. where they are now enticing um, digital nomads to a little tiny town that my husband grew up in partially in the oh, wow. 50s and the 60s called Fukuoka okay. in Japan. So tell me, what is the difference between the communities at 18 to 35 and say the digital nomad visa that they're now trying to have a setup where people have really good technology. 
where they have a good place to stay, where it's very reasonable. It's not Airbnb prices. I mean, there's a lot goes on into the thinking of creating these digital visas. Can you speak to that a little bit? Great question. And I've, one I've explored on my podcast. And I'll tell you why I'm trying to explore it, because I'm a tad confused myself. And I'll, I'll explain myself and I want to see what you think, right? So we mentioned from pre-COVID work permits. They still exist. So you can still, 1835, yeah. get a work permit. Yes. And you can stay there. The advantage yes. of those is they don't have any rules attached to them now these digital nomad visas have i think the japan one's crazy it's like sixty thousand dollars to to qualify yes. if you earn that much which is quite a lot of money for a, yes. a generic digital nomad right so that makes it almost quite hard for people to get that because they don't earn that much money now my question would be what is the difference if you work on a laptop and you can do remote work why can't people just go on tourist visas and just work on by themselves on their own time you know, you're visiting the country, you're not accessing right. any services. So why would you not want to do that instead of just get this digital nomad visa, which costs money, has rules attached to it, and also it might be quite hard to get because you don't hit those rules, unless it offers probably a bit more security in terms of healthcare. You, you might be able to have access to the healthcare system or... Sure. Actually, that that's one of the things that's in that rule. That That is in that rule is you have to have private healthcare and have an income of, I think it's uh, $4,000 a month, something like mm. that, US, yeah. in order to qualify for that mm. visa. And so I have asked myself the same question, is like, what is the value proposition that they, the J Japanese government is building into this? Except that I think it does several things. I think it sort of shines a light on a place that might not otherwise have a lot of attention. It also um, gives some sense of structure to people. Um, and it also means that they're not getting a lot of sort of trashy tourism because, you know, we know, you and I know, that some of these digital nomad locations have not always been maintained and are not always um, the best quality. Could you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I do have a problem with digital nomad areas, if you like, um, because my biggest problem now is that I don't think they contribute to actually to local people. And what I mean mm -hmm. by that is a classic example is Bali. Uh, you'll find a huge, huge cohort of digital <laughs> nomads there. Yes. And from people that have visited and tried to maybe test it out and see what it's like there, there's a few people that I've, I've spoken to not a fan, um, don't contribute locally, very much like um, gentrification of an area, not for locals. And yes. it's like making even like housing harder because they're just coming in because they can afford it because it's a bit cheaper. So these areas that are kind of been dominated by digital nomads are not necessarily a good thing. Um, but there are obviously areas that have been looked after and people who do the right things but maybe it's something that's going to come because like you said post covid we've got now these huge amounts of people who can do this when i traveled 10 yeah. years ago i mean it wasn't even a thing really it was it was a, th a thing but a very out there thing like you you very yes, rarely met someone on a laptop right um, it was it was very different then i would say that another place that i i'm slightly familiar with is tulum in mexico oh yeah okay <laughs> And where, you know, that started off very pristine and extremely jungle and they didn't have very good internet. So they upped the internet and, but they, but now it has a reputation as sort of a party place. Yeah. And I don't know what the benefit is to Tulum because it's, it, it's kind of been dissolved from the ancient mysterious place that it was. Yeah. It's now been totally transformed by this new community. And so I think this is a reflection that wherever we go, we take our cultures and we make a difference. Absolutely. I, I just also can't think of, I won't say anything worse, but imagine you're like visiting Japan on this digital nomad visa or Mexico, but you're just yeah. going to somewhere like Tulum where they, everyone else is. I mean, I, I get to a point that they might have internet, which is key. You're going to need good internet. That's the one rule you're going to have for digital nomadism, right? But uh, I'm sure places around the world, I went to India and I had the best internet ever there. Got a local yeah. SIM card, 5G, yeah. no problems, right? So there's yeah. so many options in the world. And I find it quite strange that people sort of go to these like siloed locations where it's kind of the place to be. But 
why not go and put yeah. yourself in uh, i don't know in city in colombia or down the south of argentina or in the middle of yeah. india somewhere where you can really immerse yourself yeah. in local culture and just be mindful yeah. of the local culture yes as the cultures are changing around the world and and i've watched globalization i've participated in it mm. i've been um both uh an engineer of it in some ways as being a long-term expat I've also been a victim of it in some ways because of rules and regulations of being an accompanying spouse in Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've seen many sides of this story, and I think that it, it really behooves us to have a very good dose of cultural intelligence um, before we go to a place yeah. because otherwise I think we bring a lot of disturbance and disruption with us. True. And I think if you can be a digital nomad or just work on your laptop and maybe get the digital nomad visas and or just go on a tourist visa, the options are endless and slow travel is better in the long run. I yes. think if you can actually immerse yourself in a local culture and go and invest in local things, that can only be good. Um for everyone involved but i think these little areas or pockets of the world where essentially westerns meet up to be digital nomads and like live in this community is a bit weird mm -hmm. i get that there's dedicated spaces to that because they want to have like a i don't know meeting room and good wi-fi but maybe that's a key point but yeah i i do think the options are endless and slow travel is the way to go i also i know that belonging and finding some community wherever you are is a big job yeah. And I recently, I, my home dem domicile is actually San Miguel de Allende in Mexico. Okay. And I recently had a friend who is a um, mobile businesswoman on the show um, while she was staying in Mexico. And I watched her very deliberately meet people she had to get out and find her community her own unique community although we introduced her to lots of people but i could really tell that especially for single women who are traveling mm -hmm. that need for community and connection is very human and we take it with us wherever we go and i believe that my thought is that maybe the pre-conception or the construction of these digital nomad communities is based on hey let's build a connecting formula where people just plug themselves in you know they just show up and there there's people who speak the same yeah. language sound like them look like them and and that it is very different from the type of travel that you experience and also the type of travel that i used to isn't it a tad ironic that they are connected by the digital miracle, yet they still feel the need to go and physically be somewhere in the same place where, in theory, you could just be connected in your own little dots around the world just by being on the internet. So I'm interested to understand what the why you have to be physically there as a connection. And maybe that's I because I'm quite comfortable being on my own sometimes. But I also have a really good group of friends at home. So for yeah. me, this concept that people travel to meet people as the number one thing is quite interesting. It's not the way I normally travel because I would see meeting people as a byproduct. I'm yeah. going to this place because I want to experience this experience. And if I'm in a hostel or a hotel or whatever, and there's a group of people who happen to be doing the same thing and we get on, that's great. I love that. Yeah. But some people may force that issue a little bit. And I saw a quote the other day from a, another podcaster who said, like, just travel for the things that exist, not based on the person you haven't even met yet which is quite an interesting comment that I've been thinking about. Well, I think that change is all there is. And I think that we're navigating change as humans. But my sense is distance has been a factor in our lives, my husband and my life for, you know, over four decades. And distance, if you don't work at maintaining these connections, real relationships, in-person yeah. relationships, I, my experience is they're very different from the digital relationships I have. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what people are looking for. They're looking for that human factor. They're looking for the uh, experience of the physicality because our brains actually function differently when we're talking to a screen or when we're, than when we're talking to a person. And that yeah. uh, now neuroscience is starting to catch up to 
So what's the difference? <laughs> and and so maybe the next uh, 10 years or the next decade will, because now, you know, they're bringing out these, the, the new eyeglasses. Uh, that, virtual reality. Yeah. Yes. And virtual reality is wonderful, but it's not the same as seeing the ladies in their beautiful costumes, balancing all those bananas and pineapples and fruit on their heads as they're mm. walking down the street in Bali. And I think that my body and my brain and my body processes that differently in some way. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why I travel because I want to see those experiences of, I guess, the local culture and what they do. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm a tad lucky. I, I said to my girlfriend the other day that I do have a, a really strong cohort of friends at home. I don't live in Norwich. I live in Vancouver. Yeah. And I visit yeah. maybe once a year, maybe twice. Yes. But it is like being back at school as soon as I'm with them. And I, and I appreciate that it's lucky. And a lot of people don't have that. And maybe yeah. they're in search of a physical community to try and find. And I'm all yeah. for it. Um, yeah. So that's maybe, maybe why I'm struggling to understand why people would go and like go to these like digital nomad areas and just physically try and be amongst people. Well, don't you think that that's the cord or the thread that magnetizes all of us to get on the road originally? Yeah, maybe, yeah. Yeah. Because just... my question that I keep asking is why travel? So why did, why did, why did you start traveling? I started traveling because I wanted to live in a different place. Uh -huh. I also wanted to go and see things that aren't in Norwich. So what I mean yeah. by that is I want to go and see Angkor Wat. If you want to go and see Angkor Wat, you're going to have to go to Cambodia. <laughs> Yes. Uh, I want to see Bangkok and go eat some street food. You have to go to Bangkok. Yeah. So yeah. I was probably, it sounds a bit shadow almost saying this, but I had things that I just really want to experience. And I had my sure. friend with me who's a good friend. And we we always talk about those, that six months at the start. Yeah. We met so many amazing people. Yes. But I, I don't want to sound too old, but back in those days, there was no phones. So what I'm, what I'm trying to say yeah. is when you when you go to a hostel and you're sitting there, yes. now you'll see people on the phones. But back in those days, it's like, oh, you're – you're talking all yeah. the time or you're probably reading books. <laughs> yeah. And you're probably like, the connection is real. You know, when the people that I met in that six months, we've always got this connection because it's such a shared experience where I'd probably yeah. not had the same connection with people post probably the you know, mobile phone, even like 20, 13, 14, not been the same. I met some great people, but, but there's something yeah. different there. And it's hard to pinpoint what that is. Yeah. It is hard to pinpoint it, isn't it? So um, inquiring minds here want to know last mm. year you went to, Europe for part of it, I think. And then you went through the Middle East during Ramadan and mm. you went to one of my most favorite countries in the world, Oman. Oh, yeah. When we went to Oman, uh, the second or third time I was there, we did a like a tour. You know, we would spend mm -hmm. a few nights here and a few nights there. And we went up to the Grand Canyon in mm -hmm. Oman. But tell me, what was wild camping like in Oman? Because I just don't have a picture of that. <laughs> Yeah, so one of my goals for 2023 traveling was to wild camp in Oman. Now, in Oman, you can camp anywhere. So there's yes. no rules. And yes. there's also no facilities. Yes. So I maybe didn't appreciate that before I went. Uh -huh. So the plan was we would get our car and we'd get all the tent and gear, which you can rent or buy. Yes. Whatever you want to do. And we'll go and drive around the country. Now, we successfully drove around the country. But one thing we didn't really take into account is May gets a bit hot. Oh, very, very. <laughs> um, the guy who was sort of a, like getting our stuff ready was like, yeah, you, you should be just okay, but you've got to be on the cusp of hot. Like yeah. in the evening, it might get quite cool because it's not totally summer yet, but in the day, it's going to be brutal. And he was right. I think we lasted out of the 10 days in Oman, probably four wild camping and tents, oh, wow. uh, which was great. We, we had a great experience, but we just couldn't do it because the heat, like Nizwa was like 40 degrees. Like we can't camp yeah. in that. Um, so we did stay at guest houses in the end. But an amazing trip. Drove around Amman for 10 days. Uh, saw some sights. Went to Mazira Island, which was a massive highlight. And the roads are great. The, the signs are in English. They speak English pretty much, the Amanis. And the petrol is super cheap. So a country that's, which is quite expensive in other terms can be offset by the cost of petrol. So I yes. found the experience totally amazing, really. Like, I, I couldn't believe what I've seen. That the, the colour of the sands in like uh, the Wahibi sands down there. Incredible. And so if you love that, I recommend you go to Saudi Arabia. Yes, on my list. 
Yeah. yeah. We lived there for 15 years and I wow. honestly did not. Um, it was back in the day when, you know, we weren't, because we lived there, we sort of um, took it for granted. And, and there mm -hmm. wasn't um, a lot of the airports and the infrastructure and the roads and the PR and all of the tourism structure that they've yeah. invested in over the last uh, 10 years. So um, I would love to go back as a tourist, but that was, that's just a stunning place. So do you still travel? Do you have a purpose that you set before you go off on these? Like, who do I want to be at the end of this? I want to be the person that saw this, did this. Do you have any, anything that you write down or that you set as a goal that is about your transformation? Okay, it's a good, great question. And I we learned a lot of lessons last year, partly because COVID stopped us from traveling. Yes. Um, I probably had a bit more of a backpacker budget sort of mindset. But at the end, yes. it was very different. In terms of like the Middle East, so a big purpose yes. of travel last year was we hear so much in the news about Middle East, how dangerous and how you know, the people don't like you, et cetera, et cetera. And one of my purposes was, okay, I want to go to some countries there. So I went to yeah Lebanon, um jordan Amman, um uae yeah i just want to i just want to meet some local people which we did and i found them charming and i learned a lot of lessons i love the culture and everyone helped us out uh, ramadan was interesting like there were some cafes that didn't really want to serve or be known to be serving food because ramadan but they'll close sure. their blinds and just come invite you in for tea or coffee and maybe give, give you some soup but like hidden away in the cafe because they understand tourists are trying to visit and Give you yes, that experience. Yeah. I found that the people incredibly friendly, and Lebanon was opening as well. I know it's in the news right now for not very good things, but uh, the people were were so charming. Like, yeah, uh, yeah. some of the little coffee places on the street we just went to, like totally yeah. local, yes. uh, for the smoke, like locals is having a an yeah. espresso. Oh, I loved and it. She, yeah, and shisha pipes in the evening. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they they love that, and because that was Ramadan, they have iftar meals in the evening. Yeah, and if people don't know what that is, that's like a massive meal at the end to celebrate the day of fasting mm -hmm. and as soon as the mm -hmm. bell goes they have like a tv on they all wade into this like, amazing food so and it's great yeah. food it's delicious isn't it amazing food amazing culture and i learned a lot what is your mission now i mean do you have a mission where you're um out there in com in travel communities talking about what's possible or um why people should travel or what is your is your current mission? I think my mission at the minute is I want to slow travel. Yes. And there's a certain list of things I need to do to make that happen. Last yeah. year was too quick. So flying yeah. here, road tripping here, real quick. But to be slow travel, this goes back to being a digital nomad. I don't think I can travel without an income anymore. It was quite yeah. hard seeing our savings dwindle, right? So sure. I think I need to earn money as digital nomad whatever that is so i'm trying to work sure. that out and yes. in tandem if i can be anywhere in the world and working mm -hmm. on a laptop and earn money and traveling at the same time that opens mm -hmm. the doors for anywhere because you just go on sure. the tourist visa live somewhere do some local activities maybe meet some local people and immerse yourself in culture for an extended period of time not just dipping in for two or three days so my idea is and purpose is i want to be traveling in the future but at a slower pace and more immersed in the culture to learn more about the world. Mm. And I'd love to, for the po my own podcast, eventually interview more local people. That's kind of what I see in the future, but uh, it's quite, quite far down the line that, at the minute. Mm, yes. Um, I think that having a cultural mentor, we call them cultural mentors, or people that um, help you find your way through a culture that you're living in, that's mm. also a lovely gift of living somewhere for a long time, is, is having one of the things I treasure about my experience in Mexico is I have three people in my life off the top of my head that I have fallen in love with. They're all different, all different ages and backgrounds, but I'm learning something from them. In fact, one of them is my editor. He helps edit the podcast. But mm -hmm. what happens is um, you begin to connect at a different feeling level. And so then that really helps to educate you about your travel and where you really are. Yeah, and that's the proper essence of travel in my eyes. We, we, we talked earlier about yeah. meeting people. I yeah. want that experience of 
yes being localized to an extent what i understand day to day you know what they're thinking how they live in how they're doing things i think yeah. that sort of hedonistic travel is there's a time place maybe if you're younger hence the 10 years ago trip where you know yeah drinking partying yes into hostels touristing. There. and touristing is and it's touristing. very yeah natural. yeah there's a time place for that for yourself but i think maybe when you grow of age and you travel for a bit i think you want to know more um mm -hmm. and be more invested i think is sure. that's definitely a purpose going forward 100 what would you say to someone who has um considered doing what you're doing and becoming nomadic um you've talked about the fact that you need to take your age and you probably your health and your well-being into into consideration mm. what else do you and also finances you've talked about finances what else do you think that people need to have in terms of their mindset what do they need to be thinking about yeah they need to be thinking about and this is a very key point is travel isn't going to fix stuff so what i mean by that is if you've got some issues personally that could be free i don't know growing up family issues uh your mental health is not quite as good as what should be any of these type of issues don't think travel is going to fix it because i was guilty of that probably in the first trip there's you know a lot of stories behind that but because effectively if you go if you go away for two years and you come back to where you were before and you haven't fixed those issues they're going to be the same aren't they so don't expect travel to fix those issues now travel is great because it gives you a broader perspective you learn more things but i think people need to appreciate that if they've got issues to work on they should work on them first and don't expect travel to fix that but travel can also be uh you know a learning experience but don't expect it to do miracles in terms of mental health so i think that's a very key point and i learned that from a guy called johnny bilby who um he runs the tour group wild frontiers which is based in the uk and he went on a 10-year journey of that i uh, wrote three books 10 years of traveling around and mm -hmm. he said it's just grief and he didn't actually deal with the grief because his his wife died and Oh, yeah. as part of that 10 years right when they're traveling so yeah. at the end he's like grief was still there so i had to deal with that after the 10-year trip around the world you know so mm -hmm. i think it's a key message for a lot of people i think that's a a really great place uh to start wrapping this up um i talk a lot about having two suitcases one is your stuff and one is your mental baggage yeah and so we have to pack we have to unpack our emotional baggage wherever we go yeah. And if you keep it packed up and you just take it to the next place, which is what I did when I was in my 20s and probably part of the way into my 30s as well. It was when I turned 40 and was in Saudi Arabia for 15 years that I really had to unpack a lot of things. I got time yeah. and a place to do so as well. It was a place to grow up. Tell me more about, just before we close, just tell me more about what is your dream or your vision for the next year to five years? Will you continue traveling that long as a slow mad? Yeah, my dream and my aim, is, I'm trying to make it reality, so it's not too much of a dream, is a number of steps. So step one, I need to be financially able on my own as a self-employed person or freelancer. So I'm working mm -hmm. on my own skills and trying to offer them into, I mm -hmm. guess, the freelance world. Uh, number two is get the Canadian passport. So we're here for at least 18 months to two years. Oh, um, oh really? Yep, want a second passport. So that's always been a name of mine ever since I started, yes. just to have an option. Yes. And I think post that, I think it is to, I think we have an idea to maybe just try different parts of the world in the future whilst working you know, on our own stuff trying to immerse yourself. So I'll give you an example. Like yesterday, I kept reading about Spain. Now I grew up in the UK and Spain is up the road, really. But yeah, Spain is. is so affordable and you can yeah. get a, quite a long tourist visa there. Yeah. So if you're a digital nomad and you just don't need a visa, you can just go there for six months to be yeah. financially yeah. secure. You can see the local yeah. area, do some road trips. So I think yeah. the aim is to be in these different countries for either like two weeks or six months, whatever the length of the period of time is, and enjoy the local in culture and immerse myself a bit more. And uh, also another one, just uh, sort of in the future I learned from last year is I need a home base. Now yes. it might be counterintuitive, but the key for me to slow travel or long-term travel is to have a home base. 
because what happens if you just want to stop for two months where do you go well you can't go anywhere if you've got if you've not got a home right so you have to have a right. home to reset yeah maybe, maybe chill yeah. out do some work whatever so that yeah. is our part of our thinking is to save enough money to get the home base sorted as well so i think that's pretty key well, that's wonderful. Um, I have found the benefit of, um, we had a home base here in the US, but we found that um, it was difficult to live here after we had changed so much and transformed into okay. nomadic expats around the world. Yeah. And mm. um, we still wanted, it was more normal for us to live alongside a culture we didn't fully understand and whose language we didn't know. Mm, and that was that feels much more normal. I, I, I might agree. I feel and, very and, comfortable just being around people who are, I don't know what they're saying. Um, <laughs> I don't know what's going on, but I, I'm totally fine with that. But you know, I do think that there there is a part of me that is beginning to think that that's a good thing because when you're in an English speaking environment and people are speaking loudly, you hear their conversations and then the mind gets you get kind of mm -hmm. drawn in. But if you don't yeah. understand the conversation, you just go. You can you can be more uh, discerning and less distracted. Absolutely. And actually, a good point about that is language, right? I would love exactly. to learn Spanish or Arabic. I think yeah. that's probably two languages. So I fully yeah. believe that classroom gets you a certain period of yeah. time further there, yeah. but that's it. So I yes. need to immerse myself. But yeah, I, I totally agree. But the home base for us will be Norwich, I think. Yes. Because our family so and friends are there. Well, I think that's a super idea. Now, I always... I'm going to end my episodes with two questions. What do you think the world needs most right now, James? Empathy, understanding, mm -hmm. a lack of fear of people. I think you, you must agree with this when you travel around. General person on the street is actually quite nice. Yes. Right? There's different yeah. levels of nice, but I, I've yeah. rarely met anyone who's really threatened me or yes. you know, really been out there. So I think... If I've been to so many countries and like, oh, they're, they're kind of like on the level of being the same, that means <laughs> yeah. the world is a nicer place. So I think maybe people shouldn't get too engrossed in their TV and news because it will scare you to not go anywhere. And what do you plan on doing about creating more empathy, understanding and, and having less fear in the world? The only thing I can do right now is interview people for my podcast from different cultures and understand what they're feeling and just try and give you a, a taste of what someone who is probably thousands of miles away from you is thinking about life and to see yeah. what their point of view is and there's no yeah. judgment there it's just the way it will be so yeah i need to speak to more people put it out there in the world and hopefully people will listen well thank you for coming to speak to nomadic diaries listeners today we are have been so thrilled to have your experience and your insights and to talk about these secrets and solutions that are behind the idea of slow travel. So thank you very much, James. Thanks, Doreen. It's been an absolute pleasure. And for our listeners, if you would please go online and rate and review the podcast or connect to us on social media, we can be found at Nomadic Diaries, a podcast. Sayonara. Masalama and hasta luego.